this is your intro to programming class. Um, we've already gotten some materials set up, so make sure when you're watching this that you have your um, uh, programming notebook ready to uh, do the, the exercises that are in your, your notebook, and make sure you have your video notebook ready um, to take notes and um, do exercises and those kinds of things. So what are we what are we doing in this class? So what we're we're trying to do we're not necessarily trying to to become a programmer. Um, we've talked about that before, uh, but what we are trying to do, and the reason why that that com computer programming is part of your curriculum this year, um, is to learn to think in a certain way. So programmers uh, approach pro people understand programming approach problems in a certain way. They learn how to solve problems, um, they look at the world in a certain way, and they learn how to communicate in a certain way. So we're trying to um, learn to think according to um, models, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about that as the, the class goes on. So you'll start making uh, by making a game. It'll take a few weeks. I think it'll be a little bit better game than we made in the, the summer programming class. Um, uh, so you're not just typing in code like you did this summer, but I'll give you some guidelines and then you design the, the whole thing. So that's part of this 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 class and why I chose this particular um, set of programming tools is that you do the design and that's more about the prog about the um, learning to think a certain way than just typing in the program. Another reason is that this class fits with your algebra class. So um, will learn the same terms that you're going to use in your algebra class, um, the same type of math um, using different terms, and for a while this class will actually be ahead of your algebra class. Um, like so, when we talk about positions in a coordinate system that we're going to actually talk about today or tomorrow, um, you won't talk about that in your, your algebra class for a few weeks. Um, but then later this year your algebra class will catch up and you'll be learning the same kinds of things in both programming and in algebra. So what did I mean by models? So we use models to deal with the world. And you're used to models. Um, your games are models of the world, right? Um, uh, it's simplified, but you know that your character is a person. So we can say that that maps onto a person. So um, the, and then the different objects that you manipulate you recognize them because they're models of things in your reality. And then this concept of models um, has more models inside it. So inside the game, the game map is a model of the game world, right? So when you look at a game map that tells you where you are in the world, it tells you where things, other things are, you understand that that map maps onto the game world. So we can have models of models of models. And that's what we're going to start thinking about is how we use models to see the world. Um, everybody uses models all the time for everything, even if they don't realize it. Um, and so sometimes people get confused about whether they're thinking about a model or the real thing. So um, that would be one thing I think that we can learn as you learn about programming is to really think about the models that you use in your, your mind, and how those relate to um, the real world. And so that's why um, we're talking about it, because this isn't just about programming. But if you're writing a history paper, there are certain models that you can use to look at history. You can look at an economic model, um, and then you can, can map the things that happen into history onto that model. Um, in art, you can um, look at certain forms. So in, we, we, a lot of times different subjects will talk about different things. Um, in music, we'll talk about a form, like a sonata form. Well, that's a model for looking at a particular piece. And some pieces follow that form. And sometimes good artists um, or musicians move away from that form in a surprising and interesting way. But the fact that it, it's on the form um, helps us to understand it and appreciate when they move away from it. So this whole idea of models and thinking with models um, applies to all parts of life.
Um, and, and we'll also talk about how that fits in with um, the Bible and the types of models the Bible use and the types the Bible uses and the types of um, models that we use and then we can use the Bible to um, determine whether those models are part of the real world or not and how close they are. So all those things we can look at uh, through this class. So our course materials are called Bootstrap World. So that's a, their logo, which is a picture of a boot. And I'll talk, tell you about boot, what bootstrapping means later. Um, we'll use a programming environment, um, kind of like the idle programming environment that you use this summer um, called Dr. Racket. Um, you have a printed workbook. You have your electronic video notebook that should already be started um, when you watch these videos. Um, and then sometimes in this video, I will stop and tell you to do something in your workbook or to do something in your video notebook. So when I say that, when I say stop this video and do something, then pause the video and do the thing. So um, in this course, you'll be learning a new programming language, um, which is a way to tell computers exactly what you want them to do. So you learned about Python this summer, and this is a different language called Racket. Um, just like you learn English, Spanish, or French, the programming language has its own vocabulary and grammar. And you'll, you'll see that now that you have uh, Python to compare it to. And um, especially at the beginning, we'll use a lot, we'll use some simple math that you definitely already know. So let's look at the kind of game that you'll be making um, this semester. Um, so in your video notebook, um, the, this URL is there, and you can just click on it, and you should get the same game as me. So after you, uh, so let's, let's I'll, I'll play it for a minute so you can see what it's like. So here's Ninja Cat. And this is obviously a simple game. There's the Ninja Cat. That's me. I'm controlling him, moving up and down and back and forth. He can jump. He can jump on the enemy. There's also rubies to collect. So you can see that there's uh, four or five different elements. There's the Ninja Cat that, that I'm controlling. There's the dog enemy. And there's rubies that I interact with that I can try to collect. And there's clouds that don't appear to do anything when I do them. And if I don't avoid the danger, then I get killed. All right, so that's the kind of game that you'll be playing. So why don't you stop the video now and um, play, uh, click on the, the link in your video notebook and um, play that. Okay, let's start again. Hopefully you already played that game. So this game is made up of characters, each of which has its own behavior. And we want to think about, um, um, we, won't, we won't think about much about their size. We, you know, if you notice, their size didn't change. Um, their color didn't change. The thing that changed was how they moved on the screen. So that's what we'll talk about. So the ruby moves from right to left. So does the dog. Um, Ninja Cat, and those were automatic, right? The ruby was moving automatically and the dog was moving automatically. Ninja Cat only moved when I hit the arrow keys and can move up, down, left, and right. Oops. And then um, we, so we can figure out how the game works by understanding how each character works. So turn to page two in your workbook, and you have a table that we'll use to what they call reverse engineer. So we'll analyze how Ninja Cat and see how it works. Um, so fill out the first column um, in your notebook, in, in that page two of your notebook, in your, of your workbook, um, that, which says things in the game. So flip over to where you were playing the game, and then uh, in your workbook list all of the different things, the characters, and images, and those kind of things in the game. So pause now and do that. Okay. All right. Did you list all four moving characters? So there were four characters that moved. You should have all of those. And then what else is in the, in the game? 
So is the background, did you notice the background is part of the game? And did you notice that the score was part of the game? Remember in the program we made this summer, the score was something we had to code. So list that as part of the game. So now look at the second column in your workbook. So now we have all of the things that are in the game. So what is changing when the play, we play the game? So how does the ruby change? Does it get bigger? Does it change color? Does it spin? Uh, but no, the only thing that changes about the ruby is its position, right? Everything else was the same. Um, and so fill in the rest of the, the second column with what changed about the dog and the cat and the clouds and everything else you listed um, in the first column. Then put uh, right in the second column what they what changed about each one of those. And then uh, so pause the video and do that now. OK, did you notice that the dog, Ruby, Cloud and Cat only changed position? They didn't change anything else. Uh, what about the background? It doesn't change at all. So you can leave that cell blank and the score. Um, how did it change? It didn't move, but its content changed. So computers, like you, you, you learned some this summer, use numbers to represent a character's position on the screen, um, just like a number line, um, and use uh, on the bottom of the screen, we'll call it zero, the, the bottom left of your screen or of the game area. Um, so you can see this dog right here. Here's his number line, he's just moving left to right, and he's at position three, or at least the middle of him. We'll, we'll say the middle of him is at position three on this number line, but he could move anywhere in this gaming system we're talking about uh, from zero on the left to 640 on the right. So it would always be 640 on the right. So we can take that image of the dog put it anywhere on the line, and then measure the distance back to the left-hand side. Um, any any body else or any part of the system that knows, um, can, can figure out the exact position of the dog by knowing where he is on the number line. So for this, this image, think about where he would be if he was off the screen. And now, think on the coordinate system that goes all the way to 640. What would make him be all the way off the screen? So we can add a second number line and put the character anywhere on the screen in either dimension. So dimension would be uh, left to right is a dimension, and up and down is a dimension. So that's the word we'll use for those. And we can call this left to right, the x-axis, and the up and down, the y-axis. And that's just traditional terms. There's nothing special about those names. It's just that traditionally, uh, and, and in, in algebra, so this is an algebraic concept we're learning, the x-axis is called, or the this bottom one across the bottom is called x, and the one going up and down is called y. Uh, and so together, these are called the coordinate system. So you'll hear some people say coordinates. And, and in our system, of course, we won't have these little lines or these little dots. But a lot of times on, on, uh, when you're working with it, it's helpful to either draw little, little dotted lines or think about the little dotted lines of where something is. So this ninja cat is at a specific place. If 0, 0 is in the lower left, and then six, remember we said that the, the, the bottom, the x-axis goes up to 640. And the system we're learning about, the y-axis, the top of the top right-hand corner of the screen, will be at 480. So if you know if you know that, if you know that this whole thing is 640 and it goes up to 480, then you can kind of figure out exactly where Ninja Cat is on the screen. So if we want to find where Ninja Cat is on the screen, 
then that's what this is showing. We can draw a line down to the bottom and see where this where this is on the x-axis, is what they call this bottom line. And we can draw a line from his middle over to the side on the y-axis. And those two numbers, x and y, tell you where exactly where Ninja Cat is. And the way we write these down is x then y. And so usually we'll, we'll do them like this in a pair, they call it. So 250 is x and y. 200 is x, 50 is y. Or another way to say it is the x coordinate is 200 and the y coordinate is 50. So depending on how a character moves, their position might change on the x-axis or only on the y-axis or both. So look back at the table that you wrote in your workbook and then um, can Ninja Cat move up and down and left and right or just one or just the other? So go back and play the game if you need to and think about um, if Ninja Cat can only go up and down or only go left and right or both. And then in the third column, we'll write it, what's changing? Ninja Cat's x-coordinate or y-coordinate or both. And then we'll think about all the other characters that you have here. In this last column, write what's changing for each of the characters. x-coordinate, y-coordinate, both or none. So stop the video now, and you can go back and look at the explanation about coordinates again if you need to. But then write in this third column where you said how things are changing. Um, describe specifically if they're changing on the x-coordinate or y-coordinate or both. Okay. So now, look at page three of your workbook, and you, you have that picture, that same picture of Ninja Cat. So what coordinates do you think um, So, um, in that picture on page three, what are the coordinates, and this is just a guess, right? Um, well, this first part's not a guess. What are the coordinates at the bottom left corner of the screen? and the top right and the center. So you can figure those out, um, especially you know you might have to, to do some math to figure out the center, but what are the coordinates of the center of the screen? And then um, for practice, label the coordinates at the midpoint of each side. So the bottom center down here on that picture, the top center on the picture, on the right-hand side of that picture and on the left-hand side. What are the midpoints? And then also, um, right in there, just make a little guess about what, where Ninja Cat, the dog, and the ruby, make a guess as to what you think their coordinates might be. Okay, so first figure out those midpoints. And then make a guess as to what those coordinates might be, and just write them write them right on your notebook page. So um, pause the video and do that. Okay, we're coming about to the end of this, and we're going to start working on your game. So on page four, you'll see a planning template for your game. So go ahead and start to fill that out. Um, you, you know, you can already fill out your name and then start thinking, um, just like we made the list of everything that's in Ninja Cat, we need a list of the same kinds of things for your game. So, uh, you'll need to have four things. A background, so it could be a forest, a city, space, Japan, uh, a castle, whatever you want the background to be. Um, a player. So a person, uh, or an animal, or a vegetable, or whatever your main player is going to be that's going to uh, move when you hit the key. 
a target, which in, in the Ninja Cat case was the ruby, which flies from right to left, and you get points for hitting it, and a danger, which was the dog in Ninja Cat, which is going to come um, from right to left, just like the dog did, and you must avoid, which you must avoid. So those are the main parts of your game. Go ahead and fill those in on that page of your workbook. Yep, so fill that in on that part of your, your workbook, um, and that's the end of your class for today.